history of our city. Um, that's also been true across the country. Over 41,000 lives lost last year to guns. Um, and every one of those, you know, a, a child of God made in the image of God. So uh, as I came out of that meeting this week, um, actually we were in the middle of that meeting and we heard the gunshots again and it was a, uh, an assault rifle. 49 rounds were shot, I'm told, in less than a minute on my block this week. Uh, and one person lost their life and uh, cars had all their windows shot out. It hit the transistor and blew out our electricity. So that just shouldn't be normal, right? But it's also like one of the things that we keep telling ourselves is um, for those of us who believe in resurrection, we got to have that kind of defiant hope that life is more powerful than death, that love is stronger than hatred. And um, I always tell folks um, in my neighborhood, you know, if we believe in resurrection, this is a great place to live because we get to practice it and proclaim it every day, even when it feels like there's a whole lot of uh, uh, struggle. So I, th what I thought I'd do this morning, first of all, I have respect for anybody that can come to Sunday morning and sit through a sermon, and you stayed for a second one. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not going to preach a sermon, but I did. Like, I switched gears when I heard you had an LED wall, uh, and I brought some pictures that I think for me, I want you to think of this kind of like our family photo album, uh, and, and it's cool that we've got this big uh, display here, but this is where our community started, and I'm sharing these not as a anecdote for what you need to do, but just to tell you some of what we've been learning for 20 years, and then we'll have time to uh, dialogue a little bit, but the pictures help a little. So I'm on the north side of Philly, a neighborhood called Kensington, and um, the, um, uh, some folks in Philly, they call our neighborhood the Badlands, but I always correct them and say, that's exactly what they called Nazareth. You know, people said nothing good could come from there. So you better look out if you stigmatize a place and say nothing good could come from there because that's where God shows up. And God shows up all the time in our neighborhood, uh, even with the struggles that it has. And I first got involved in Kensington in a, that abandoned church right there. Um, we have more abandoned buildings than there are folks on the street. And one of those was this abandoned Catholic church building, also kind of a commentary of how the church often has forsaken some of our neighborhoods. There's abandoned churches everywhere. And um, this one, in 1995, had a group of homeless families that moved into it. Uh, some of y'all might know a little of our story. Those courageous mothers and children moved into this building and started living there because there was a 10-year waiting list for affordable housing. 3,000 families on the waiting list for housing. They had nowhere to go, so they moved in, and they put a banner on the front um, that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? Come on, right? And uh, they lived there, but the Catholic Church gave them 48 hours to get out, gave them an eviction notice, and, uh, and, and they, they said, you're trespassing on church property. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up, you know. And we read that in the newspaper. And it sparked a student movement. That's how I got involved. We organized students to basically move in in solidarity with those families. Um, the families had a press conference, and they said, they had you know, all the media there, and they said, we mean no disrespect to the church officials or the Catholic archdiocese, but um, they said, we have uh, talked to the real owner of this building, the Lord Almighty, and God said we can stay. And they stayed for months and months. And that old cathedral, it's, it's kind of, I, I kind of think it's deep and a little ironic that our sort of vision for church started in the ruins of that abandoned church. But it's there, Pastor Ray, that we, we said, we're going to, you know, we've got all kinds of bad stories of our church experiences, but we're going to, like Gandhi said, we should be the change we want to see in the world. We're going to work on being the change we want to see in the church. And we uh, caught that vision in the book of Acts. We moved on to the block. And Katie and I got married in there. That's what you saw a picture of there. That's, by the way, a homemade tuxedo. Um, 
my mom helped with that one, but uh, that's my lovely wife, and that's our neighborhood. The building was still abandoned, so we got permission uh, to go back in. <laughs> that could have ended bad, you know, and so we uh, got married there, and then, you, you know, we, th- th- we had our celebration on our block. That, that's our neighborhood gathered, and it's a place that we've called home for the last uh, 25 years. We uh, rode off on our stretch limo there. That's our uh, um, tandem bike, and uh, and, you know, for us, so this neighborhood is where everybody used to move. It's an old factory town, and now you can see a lot of the abandoned buildings because we've lost 100,000 jobs. We've got 700 abandoned factories, uh, but it's in that space that we're proclaiming uh, God's love and hope and resurrection, and so we uh, bring a lot of abandoned spaces back to life. And you'll see some of the pictures here where for us, even though it's economically challenged, it's community rich. And isn't that true of most neighborhoods that are economically poor are community rich because it's how people have survived. And a lot of neighborhoods that are well off financially, um, they struggle with the community part, right? With the knowing their neighbors. So you'll see a few images. This is summer in North Philly is the open fire hydrants. And um, some of my environmentalist friends got upset about that. But listen, all the water gets recycled, I'm told, and everything. But uh, it's how we stay cool. And, you know, we try to, like, this is what we're interested in is, is trying to figure out how we can be church, um, it, not just as a meeting or a building, but in, on the sidewalk, in the streets, you know. And uh, one of the... The things we've never done is a Sunday service because we said there's a lot of Sunday services, so we're going to go to worship in our neighborhood, but we're trying to figure out how to build community all the other days. So this is my mentor uh, with the purple shirt on there, uh, Sister Margaret, because as we started doing this stuff, you know, we... It was great because we, we had this 20-year-old fire, you know, we're going to reimagine the church. And Sister Margaret was, uh, she's, she's like 90 years old now, and she's a Catholic nun. And she said, well, there's, it's great to see this fresh zeal. And, and there's some of us that have been trying to do community for a while. She said, we've been, our community's been around for 1,600 years so we can share some tools, you know. And she became my mentor. And uh, a lot of what we do is, trying to live the gospel out of dinner tables and living rooms, you know, and there's folks that talk about the mega church, but we kind of talk about the micro church, you know, and like, how do we live this every day out of our homes? So we have like rhythms for our neighborhood. This is Mother's Day where we celebrate the moms and we've created kind of every month almost almost there's some kind of celebration that brings us together. So this is our back to school party where we close like three blocks down, and we, uh, you know, it's hard to get excited to go back to school, so we try to make it exciting, and got like a, that's a two-story water slide with liability insurance, and, uh, you know, and we, this is one of my favorite days, we decided to, we did a press release, kind of a spoof, but we told all the media, don't just come to Kensington when there's something bad happening, come on a good day too, and we set, we said, we're setting a record not for the most opioid deaths or whatever, but for uh, we're setting a Guinness Book of World Record, and that's my buddy Josh Horton there. He's the best juggler in the world, and he set the world record for the most apples sliced while juggling machetes. There you go, set right on Potter Street, right? But I say all that to say part of what we believe in is joy, right? It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that defies all the negativity around us. And so we try to cultivate and protect joy. And you'll see that in some of these pictures. We, we, um, when we talk about our theology, we try to make it something that's not just words on paper, but something you can see. So we talk about resurrection like the early church talked about it. They, they said resurrection was not just a one-time event 2,000 years ago, but it's something we proclaim and we practice and we live into every day. So these are a few resurrection pictures. This is a before and after of an abandoned house that we fixed up. So we're taking abandoned houses, turning them into affordable housing, and uh, these are a couple pictures of that. We take abandoned lots like this one, and, um, and we're turning them into gardens, and even those hubcaps up there are turned into flowers. So we're trying to live into that 
all things can be made new sort of thing, right? So uh, th- about 10 years ago, we had a terrible fire, and it burnt down uh, an entire block of our neighborhood. It started in, that, in one of the abandoned factories, burnt down our community center, our homes, and this is what it looked like afterwards. But we came together as a neighborhood, and that's what it looks like now. We rebuilt that space. We call it Phoenix Park because it came out of the ashes, and we've been painting murals. You'll see that there, and taking whatever we got. We got a lot of tires, Ray, so we uh, take our tires and try to turn them into something. And um, this is a a, a mural of, um, it's actually made by a famous artist named Banksy, and it's two kids standing on a pile of bombs and weapons and uh, kind of casting a vision for a new world. So that's the side of Katie and I's house right there. And then you'll see a few other images of some of the murals that we've done. We kind of see every wall as an open canvas, you know, a space where we can bring art and beauty and imagination. And we kind of learn as we go. There's one of them here where we painted a mail container. And uh, come to find out, it's a federal crime to paint a mail container. Uh, but uh, that's it right there. It doesn't it look pretty green, but they didn't think so. But we, uh, we, uh, we, they were kind with us. But that's uh, one of our most theological murals. So you can see the rolled away stone and the lion, the lamb, and the dove there. And one of my neighbors said, uh, she was walking by it, and she said, this is like our stained glass window. She said, I can see God's love kind of shining out over the neighborhood. So that's kind of how I think of some of the art that we're creating and um, we're growing food. I think uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is you hear a lot about the food deserts, you know, and lack of access to healthy food. Uh, so we're planting gardens and uh, growing food. And one of my neighbors, I get some of my best theology from my neighborhood. I went to seminary and all that, but some of my best theology I hear from, from folks right next to me. And one of the moms in our neighborhood, she said, I get what we're, what we're doing. I said, what? And she said, we're trying to bring the Garden of Eden to North Philadelphia. And in some ways, that prayer that Jesus teaches us, you know, to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we kind of uh, think of that as bringing God's dream to our block, to our neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I kind of invite you to think about what that means in your neighborhood. It might look different from mine, but we're always trying to get creative. So one of our newest things is this, It's called an aquaponic system where you have fish and plants that are growing together. My wife said it's like a really fancy uh, science experiment that works sometimes and other times not. But we have fish that grow and they um, produce the plants and it's been pretty cool. So you'll see this uh, photo of all the kale that we, Swiss chard and kale and stuff we're able to share uh, in the neighborhood. And... um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what it looks like. And then um, there's also a part of this work that, as you think here, you know, in the Atlanta area, and we're looking at our neighborhood, we're always asking, what are the obstacles to the kingdom? You know, Scripture says that there's principalities and powers that we're fighting against. And so even as we celebrate uh, the beauty of what God's doing, we're also trying to pray that God would heal the wounds of those principalities and powers. And so this is our front door. It says, heal all that is broken in our hearts, in our streets, and in our world. There seems to be a lot of folks that just think about personal salvation and they forget that God also wants to transform the world. There's also a lot of folks that get excited about justice work, but we forget that God's personal and God's also healing hearts. And so I think that's one of those things that are like two sides of scissors. You know, we got to hold them together. We've got to uh, recognize that God is healing our own hearts, and, and God's also healing our neighborhoods and our world. And I, I wanted to give you just a few glimpses of what that looks like. Um, uh, this, one of the things that we struggle with is the opioid crisis, right? We are a containment unit in our neighborhood of the opioids all over our city. We lost 1,200 lives uh, to, to heroin mostly um, in Philadelphia. And our kids see needles everywhere. And we said, that's not God's dream. That's messed up. Uh, I remember one of the kids was having a snowball fight. 
and they, they mentioned how scared they were when they were making the snowman that they might find a needle underneath the snow. We're like, this is messed up. So we, we uh, prayed, you know, what can we do about it? We got the kids together, and we had a campaign called Need a Little Help. And we gathered up our needles all from our blocks, and we uh, put them in jars, and we marched them to City Hall. And we called on our mayor, our public health commissioner, our city council members, police commissioner. We had quotes from the kids, and the kids are the ones that delivered them. In fact, they spoke at the press conference, and we delivered a bottle of needles to each of our city leaders. And it reminds me of Dr. Martin Luther King. He said that we've got to make injustice uncomfortable so that it stirs people to take action. And that's kind of what this was, was making folks a little uncomfortable. It was right after that that our city declared a state of emergency, and we're still working on it. We're not anywhere near where we need to be, but we're, we've got needle canisters that are out on corners where they can be safely disposed of. We've got relief that's going towards recovery communities because we don't just want more jails. We want more resources for folks that uh, are struggling with addiction. But it was a powerful little movement, you know. Um, so I think... You know, as we think of some of the other ways that the church can be a conscience, uh, I think of this church, uh, this is LaSalle Street Church in Chicago. I love their front, front uh, banner on their building. Of course, we welcome refugees, we're Christians. <laughs> and then it says Jesus was a refugee, right? So uh, I think we're in a moment right now where Dr. King uh, also said that the church is not meant to be the servant of the state or the master of the state but the church is meant to be the conscience. So the question we can all ask is, how can this community, the village, how can the larger church in Atlanta, how can we be the conscience of our society? How can we, we serve that role? So this is one of the things that I did with a bunch of other leaders. We gathered the dreams of dreamers, of immigrant families from all around the U.S., and we took 3,000 dreams uh, alongside many of the young immigrant families and we went into the offices of uh, the Capitol, and we read those dreams. And we prayed prayers for immigration reform. And we made it personal, because there were stories of immigrant families that have escaped things we can only imagine uh, that we brought before them. And uh, this is us on our knees praying outside of the Senate offices. And, uh, and then, you know how some of these stories end. Uh, <laughs> We got arrested, but as we were getting arrested, uh, the, one of the police officers said, we're with you, we're with you, we need to do better for immigrant families. I did say, well, then why are you arresting us? You don't have to do that. But anyway, you know, uh, but, you know, I think that's what we're doing, right, is stirring the, the, that, that conscience and saying there's an urgency right now, right? And uh, you can tell I take a few cues from Dr. King, and Dr. King said that traffic lights are good things. But when a fire is blazing, you go through the traffic lights, the ambulance, the fire engines go through because people's lives are at stake. And so some of this is about stirring uh, the hearts of folks to say, well, we, we've got a fire on our hands. And one of those, um, uh, so there's immigration. There's also, as Ray said earlier, I've, we've been doing a lot around the death penalty. And... Um, Pennsylvania still has a death penalty, though we have a moratorium right now. Um, Georgia, as you know, is one of the bi biggest executing states in the country. So is Tennessee right now. My home state still has the electric chair. Um, and so what we've done is we, we gather um, annually at the Supreme Court and we remember the names of all the folks who have been executed, over 1,500 people who have been executed by uh, our state. Um, but we also remember the names of the victims because we say to be against the death penalty is not to be against justice or to be numb to the pain of murder victims' family members, but we believe that we can do better than killing someone to try to show that killing is wrong. And so we laid roses in two colors at the Supreme Court, um, one to honor the, those that have been murder victims and also to honor those who uh, whose family members are on death row or those who are facing execution. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that because I know there's a lot of organizing happening in Georgia. But part of what we're doing is just trying to humanize folks, right? To, and I was uh, in Oklahoma 
uh, last week with, because Oklahoma has set 25 execution dates right now. So we're, we're holding vigils every execution. And you can join us online. Um, they're, they're usually hybrid. So we have people on the ground that are in person and folks that join online. And many of these folks we get to know. Like I, I was with James Coddington um, four days before he was executed along with his pastor. We prayed together uh, and we, we talked for an hour and a half. And, and uh, you know, he said, some days it's hard for me to wake up knowing what I did. I did something terrible. And he says, I've done everything I know to heal the wounds of that. And he fell in love with Jesus and dedicated his life to Christ. And um, he's, he uh, um, ended up being executed last week. But um, his last words were words of forgiveness and words of... Uh, uh, of hope and love. And the last scripture he heard, my friend read to him, was from Romans. It said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Uh, but there's so much at stake with these things, right? And so we're, we're praying for Georgia too, knowing Georgia will be even more beautiful once we can abolish the death penalty. And hopefully Christians can play a huge role in that. So um, that's uh, uh, the, some of those pictures. Now the last ones I wanted to show you are around the guns. Um, because the gun violence, is, as you know, uh, is just, it, it's unimaginable the amount of lives that we're losing and have lost. It's over 110 lives every single day. And just to make that plain, in my lifetime, I'm 47 years old, in my lifetime, we've lost more lives to guns domestically than in all of the casualties of all of America's wars throughout history. And gun deaths are the number one cause of death of our children right now, above cancer and cars or anything else. Uh, that became real personal in North Philly when, you know, we saw too many, held too many hands of folks who lost their loved ones. And one of those was right in front of my house was a 19-year-old that was killed. And that's what shook me to really want to respond. And um, so in Philadelphia, we've done some, some creative uh, things to try to stir people's hearts. This is what we call a memorial to the lost. And it's uh, on a you know, worship space. There's a lot of these now. But they have the names and ages of everyone who died in our city last year. And so every time you're coming into worship, you know, you're remembering those names and faces and stories. And we're leaving with that commission to participate in the holy work of healing uh, the violence in this world. Um, and we also have gotten really inspired. By the way, Neil has rocked these images. Uh, this, he's, he's made some of these I'm seeing for the first time because he recreated them probably like two in the morning last night. But um, we got inspired by this verse, right, from both Micah and Isaiah that says, God's people will beat their swords into plows, their spears into pruning hooks. And then it goes on to say, nation will not rise up against nation. We will study war no more. And um, that vision um, literally is about transforming instruments of death into tools of life. And it's a reminder that metal that is crafted to kill can be recrafted and uh, to cultivate life. And so we, 10 years ago, we said, we don't have a lot of swords, but uh, we've got a lot of guns. And so let's invite people to donate them, and let's beat them into garden tools. And our first donated gun was an AK-47. And we turned it into a shovel and a rake. This is it. This is the before shot, and that's the after. Come on! It's pretty sweet, right? That was our, that was our very first one, Ray. I was telling you and Jane that last night. That's the first gun that we repurposed. And we've been doing it for over 10 years. And now there's a national network of blacksmiths and metal crafters and bishops and pastors that have learned uh, blacksmithing to do this. And we've gotten photos from all over the world, like this one, of folks that have made um, musical instruments. That's an actual guitar. Um, Deborah Lynn, we're going to have to get you one of those, right? Uh, and this is a saxophone in Mozambique that's made out of a um, semi-automatic rifle. Uh, and, you know, one of the, uh, these images right here is from Iraq. I, I spent time in Iraq during the war, 
and my friends in Najaf uh, poured the guns in the streets and they let the kids run over them uh, with the bulldozer and they crushed the guns. So that vision, you know, of beating swords into plows, it inspires us every day. Um, and one of the most powerful uh, gun conversions we did was this one. This was a handgun that we found in one of the abandoned houses, just showing, reminding us of how saturated we are with guns. We have more guns than people in the United States. And so we found this gun, and we began to heat it up, but then we felt really moved by the Spirit to invite anybody that had been impacted by gun violence to take the hammer. And this one mother, Miss Ryans, she got a picture of her boy who was killed on her shirt. And as she began pounding on that gun, I'll never forget it, she said, this is for my boy. And I think that's when we realize that what we're doing with the guns is not just poetic, right? It, it is that, but it's more than art or poetry or symbol. It's actually honoring the grief and the trauma and the pain that so many people have experienced and offering it, them a channel to um, transform something and also to pray for the healing of violence in our country and in our world. So these are a few of the images of, that's the gun that we just saw chopped and that's um, the, the tool that we made that day. And you'll see some of the other tools that we've made uh, over the last 10 years. So now I've got a little shop with guns all over the country that we've chopped up and all of them have stories. So many of them have tragic stories. Um, but this is what we do. So today we also uh, have a chop saw up here, as you may have seen. And um, the, uh, you know, there's some churches that one of the things that we found with the guns is that Christians own guns at a higher rate than the general population. In fact, the highest gun-owning demographic in America um, are Christians, so folks that we're worshiping Jesus on Sunday, and then we've, we're, we're kind of trying to hold the cross that says love your enemy in one hand and a weapon that's, you know, in the other, and it becomes really hard for a lot of folks. So all across the country, we've created a network of safe surrender sites. I sometimes call them chop saw churches. So um, we, we, we've joked about having a bring your gun to church Sunday so that we can chop them up on the altar, right, and disarm our hearts. Um, but we do have um, a gun that is unloaded and that we've, um, we've prepared to chop this morning. Do you want to say anything more about it, Ray or Jane? I don't want to make you say it, but if you want to, you're very welcome to. Yeah. Hey, hey everybody. Um, I'm just really excited for Shane to be here and for him to do this for me. I want the whole world to know that the gun that I own will never harm anyone. And um, so we just, I just want to say thank you. And uh, I've had this gun for a long, long time. And um, I really don't even know why I had it. But I knew after what happened in my family that I didn't want it to get in the hands of the wrong person. And when we met Shane, I knew that I, that's what I wanted to do. So thank you. Thank you so much from me and my mom. Stay here, man. Let's pray together before we chop. God, we do pray that you would continue to heal our hearts and heal our streets, heal our families. Thank you for Jane. Thank you for her mom, her family who's here. We pray you would continue to work your holy and miraculous healing power. And even that the, the scars of that would be a space where your, your love can touch others who have been impacted by violence. And that we might build a world where we study war no more and where we learn violence no more.
Amen. And my nephew, Clayton. This is for Johnny and Clayton. Well, I can't talk because they're so sad. All this just brings it back to me. Never forget that morning. He came. It was 4.30 in the morning, real early, and I knew she was coming that day to my house to go shopping at 8.30. And I said, what are you doing here so early in the morning? I said, I thought she was coming to go shopping. It's too early to go shopping. Oh, she said, Mama opened the door and let me in. I got, I, I, when she got inside, she said, Mama, I hate to be the bearer of this news to you, but somebody's got to tell you. <laughs> and then she told me about it. And Johnny and Clayton had shot each other. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> I thought I couldn't live, but he's brought me through. Yeah. He's brought me through. Jesus brought me through with the help of these. Oh, I appreciate my family. I don't have many left, but... When Jane married Ray, I just said, thank the Lord. I just fell in love with all of his folks, just like sitting out there with the Lord and Daddy Ray. They came and got me this morning, just all, just all so nice to me. And that's what's kept me going is my friend. I still live in that house. I prayed that I could keep on living where I live. And he has heard and answered my prayers. And I'm still there. I have church two miles from my house, and I still drive my car. I'm just so blessed. I want to praise and honor his sweet and holy name for taking good care of me. I thought that my time has come when she gave me that news. I was always so in love with my children. Oh, my and my husband, he was such a good man. And I'm just thankful that he had gone on to be with the Lord before all this happened. Because, I mean, I, it was hard on me, but I don't think he could have ever taken that news. So anyway, I just ask all of y'all just continue praying for me that, that I would just hold up my head and hold up my heart for Jesus. And, and thank you for all all these members of this church. I feel like I'm a member here as well as at my own church. And thank you for being here today. Oh, I, I just enjoyed your your message. And just take care, and I love all of you.
So we are going to take the gun. I think Shane may make another cut or two, and we will send it to him in the mail and a couple of boxes, probably two different boxes. And then he's going to be able, out of that small gun, just a small gun, he'll be able to fashion for Jane and her mom a garden tool. And they'll be able to, because they both still get down on their knees in the garden, they're going to be able to have a little spade of some type, and they're going to be able to do garden work with something that could have hurt someone very badly. So, Shane, thank you from the moment we met you. Thank you. I've loved this. I've had people say, is there any chance he could come back? I said, I'm, I'm going to get on the list. If there's a list, I want to get on that list, and I want him to come back as many times as he'll come back because I want our church to be that kind of church, you know? Thank you all for sticking around. You've been wonderful. I forgot to mention when the bigger crowd was here, his books are over there, and they're incredible. They're incredible. I can't tell you the number of people who said to me, oh, my gosh, a Shane Claiborne book when I was in college, it changed my life. And uh, so make sure you go over there and you see that. And then if you want to support someone who is doing something really, really powerful, what they're doing, I'm so impressed. And I want you to know, find out how to connect and connect and support and help. And uh, we're going to have him come back as often as he'll come. So, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for every moment. Thank you for these sweet people who have sat and listened and soaked it in and who want to make a difference with their life. Thank you for Jane and for Joyce. And thank you for this moment of healing for them. Thank you for Shane and the work that he does. Now heal our hearts and heal our land. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.